So I just went over the introduction, so let's get into the installation of Linux Mint. We're gonna go ahead and create a thumb drive, uh, go over the actual install process. I will be putting timestamps down in the description, so check for those if you need to check back on a certain spot, that way you can easily go through it. So let's not waste any time, jump on the desktop and get into it. I do live stream every Monday and Friday, so if you have a question for me, be sure and stop into my Twitch channel and ask me live. And if you'd like to check out these streams after the fact, you can always head over to Chris Titus Tech Streams and check out my entire archive over there. All right, to start out with, before we get to the installation, we obviously need installation media. So I'm gonna be using Etcher for this because you need a working computer and a thumb drive, but at the same time, uh, this etcher will work on anything. So going to this website, uh, I'm on Linux here, but if you're on Windows or Mac, just get your corresponding installer and do it. We'll go ahead and download uh, it for Linux right now. Also for downloading, we need to download Linux Mint. I'll be doing Linux Mint LMDE4. So this version is based on Ubuntu. This version is based on Debian. Not much difference between the two. So with that, I'm gonna let these two finish downloading and then I'll go ahead and launch this from the downloads folder. All right, over in the downloads folder, we have Etcher that we just have and then the Linux Mint that we downloaded. We'll go ahead and extract this here. And this right here is an app image. So if you're on Linux, uh, just make sure you go to, if you don't have the run command, just make sure it is executable. In properties, you can look to say, hey, allow executing this program. More likely than not, it'll be like mine and you don't have to worry about this. So we'll go ahead and run this file and then it'll say, okay, what do you wanna do? And we'll go ahead and select the image from our downloads folder that Linux Mint, we'll hit open. If yours doesn't look like that, it's okay. Uh, just make sure you have that USB drive in and that ISO selected. We'll hit flash. This will take probably about five to 10 minutes. All right, I'm starting up the system right now. I have everything in, uh, went ahead and made that installation media we just made, put it into the actual system back there. So if you hit delete or F2 on your startup, you can actually go into the boot menu. I usually like to boot from my BIOS as when you go to like the last screen, you can usually do a boot override and boot directly from that USB we just made. So here's the first thing, whether to do UEFI or regular boot. You can do either one. Typically UEFI is a little newer. And if you have a really large drive over two terabytes, I highly recommend sticking to UEFI. However, if it's an older system, uh, definitely just stick with the regular one. Honestly, if you're not using a two terabyte drive, it really doesn't matter. Um, the only thing this will dictate is how good your startup looks. And most people don't even care how their startup looks. So a lot of people are fans of legacy, which is this one. And UEFI is the newer one. Um, you really can't go wrong, but if you do have problems during the installation, try switching to the other one as that might fix your problem. And some laptops will only offer UEFI as well. So we'll select UEFI and we'll go ahead and select our installation. Now, obviously, if we're using an NVIDIA driver, we'd start it here. We are not, so we're gonna just start regular. Okay, starting out here, this is what you boot into from our installation media. We'll just come over to install Linux Mint and go over the installation process. We'll go ahead and hit next to install, select your language, select your time zone. I'm in the Americas and I'm central time, so I'm gonna pick Chicago keyboard layout, and then we'll just go ahead and select our name. Now there's a couple things here. We can log in automatically or go ahead and be presented a login screen. That's entirely up to you. If you're worried about other people in your household using your computer, obviously require a login. Uh, for me, I'm the only person that's gonna be logging in this computer, so I'm gonna say log in automatically. So we'll go ahead and hit next. As far as encrypt my home folder, I'm not gonna bother with that as I would mainly use this if I was using a laptop. Uh, encrypting your home folder is really good because that's where your sensitive data usually resides. And if someone steals your laptop or something like that, having it encrypted, and even if they were able to pull the hard drive out and grab the data, it would be encrypted and they wouldn't be able to see anything, which is good. All right, we're gonna go automated, select our disk, and then 
w right now it'll erase the entire disk and install everything on it that it needs. Uh, by all means, usually I stick to the automated installation as manual partitioning can get complicated. As far as using LVM and other things, um, just know I did an entire video on LVM. So if you are curious, you can check out that video, but just know you can do multiple disks and like tie in w several disks into a single volume and other fun things with LVM. But if you only have one drive in your system, it's kind of a waste. So no, most cases I don't use LVM. And since this computer only has one drive in it, we're not going to use LVM. So we'll go ahead and hit yes to this, and this will basically format it. And we always want to install the boot menu as we want it to boot. And review the summary and click install. Typically the install process takes about five to 10 minutes. Now right here, it said partition table could not be written to restart the computer and try again. Um, now there's a couple things that can cause this. Uh, typically this is from UEFI as that's what we booted into. We can fix this sometimes by wiping out all partitions or we could just boot into legacy and just do legacy install. Um, so from here, I'm gonna go ahead, switch over to legacy as at this point, I don't think it, it I wanna keep this for beginner levels and manually editing a computer can be a little difficult. All right, we're back in our BIOS. Now we're gonna go back over to here. And this time, instead of booting into UEFI, we're gonna just boot into PNY, that's my USB drive. And this does legacy boot. Let's see if we have problems installing it now. All right, we're back on our desktop and let's start the installation again. Select all the same options and get back to our installation process. With everything typed back in, we'll hit next. And again, we'll go ahead and try to format this one more time. Now I think, I suspect this one failed because this is a rather old PC, almost uh, probably about nine years old. So uh, that can fail sometimes when trying to do UEFI on the older system as UEFI was rather new when then this system came out. So we'll go ahead and install the boot menu onto here, review our settings, click install and see what we get. As you see, all the copying started. So of course that was the issue. This old PC just couldn't do UEFI, so we went to legacy. So I'll go ahead, fast forward through all of this part. And installation is finished. This took roughly three to four minutes to install on an older base machine. So that's kind of insane that you have such an old PC like this that I'm installing, but that's also kind of the power of Linux. So we'll go ahead and hit yes to restart the system. All right, we'll go ahead and remove our installation and press enter. All right, here's the standard boot screen. We can remove this and I kind of go over the customization of this, but honestly, you can leave it five seconds at boots. It gives you options there to uh, basically fix your system if something were to go awry. So I wouldn't recommend removing it just yet as we're during the setup process. All right, and we have booted into the system. Um, it was really neat to see from between we finished installation and the time we actually get to the desktop was about 60 seconds or a little bit less than that. That's incredibly powerful to have a system built in this time and be able to do it. I mean, that's one of the big reasons why I cover Linux so much. And uh, because on Windows, there's just a huge long wait. You could wait five minutes while it gets your PC ready uh, on Windows 10. So with that, we'll go through the first steps here on Linux Mint. Typically, I disable this startup, but if you're a complete noob to it, it's worth going through. They have a really nice documentation section. So going through this welcome screen might be for you, but uh, for me, I don't like it. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out. And we are on here. Now, the very first thing I always do is update the system as that's what you do anytime you install any OS. So I'll click update manager and go ahead and walk through these steps. So the first thing is like, do you wanna switch to a local mirror? Local mirrors are usually faster than packages.linuxmint.com. You always wanna say yes to this. It'll go ahead and do that. So let's type in our password we did during setup and it'll go ahead and figure out what's the closest mirror to you and your location. This makes things way faster. So uh, definitely always do that. So what you do is click on the main Debian package right here. And when you click on that, let all these kind of go ahead and go through and then sort by speed. So let's see if there's a faster mirror out there for me. All right, in my case, the official mirror was the fastest mirror. So I'll go ahead and hit apply to that, keep it at there. 
And uh, we'll go ahead and cancel this because we also need to update the Debian base mirror as well. So let's go ahead, query it, and see what the fastest mirror is. All right, so now we've got our mirrors on the Debian side of things. You'll notice the official mirror was 3.8 megabytes per second download, and this one right here is 7.3. Even though we just wasted probably three to four minutes finding the perfect mirror, this is worth doing as we effectively doubled our download speed when we go to update our system. So I always recommend going through as you may not be lucky. These official repos, if you're in Europe, uh, I know will be a lot slower than your local mirror. So that's why I always go through double check to make sure I get the fastest connection possible on any installation I do. So we'll go ahead and hit OK to refresh the cache. All right. And uh, we're pretty much done with the software sources. We'll go ahead and close out of this. Everything's right here is good. Uh, we'll go ahead and refresh this one last time before we leave, just to see if there's any update packages. And as you see, there are. So we'll go ahead and install all these. Uh, we can now answer no to this and hit install updates. It'll prompt for our password. We'll enter that in and it'll go through and update all our packages. Uh, let's see how fast this goes as far as an update. It's 1701 or five a clock at night, just a little bit past that hour. And as you see, switching out those mirrors uh, might have seemed like it took a long time, but now that we're getting eight or nine megabytes per second download, uh, that's a huge, huge download rate to where we're now updating our system in, you know, 60 seconds, maybe two minutes. And that's just well worth the actual switch on the mirrors, as this would have taken as much time as it was to set it up initially. So. Very important, always switch your mirrors out. All right, now everything's up to date. Now with Linux, usually you don't even need to reboot after your updates. However, if it does update the Linux kernel, uh, I do recommend rebooting. Um, but for today's video, I'm not gonna reboot until we're all finished. So uh, we'll go ahead and continue working. Uh, through here, you can kind of just walk through a couple things through the start menu. Uh, very, very reminiscent of Windows in this regard. You have all applications. If you need anything in particular, you could just go up to here and say, you know what, I need Firefox. And it'll pull that in. So very intuitive. As far as this goes, we can select that. That's the software manager that we can actually go ahead and pick applications. So let's say we wanted to install Steam. Let's go ahead and grab that or multimedia codecs. Let's say we want to play movies. Uh, I definitely recommend getting uh, multimedia codecs as that's something that most people want. So we'll go ahead and hit continue. And again, we'll need to sign in. So that should install. We'll go ahead and hit back and look at any other packages maybe to round this out. I think we can go ahead and grab VLC as that's a good media player viewer. If we wanted to actually play anything through here, we'll go ahead and hit continue here as well. And see if, uh, play some games through Steam as well. Let's go ahead and grab it. And we'll go ahead and install. You'll notice it's not prompting for a password this time around. It's just saying, hey, these extra things are needed. And what it does is it's kind of neat. It actually queues up everything that's being installed. So we can actually go through and just pick out everything we need from the software manager here. Now, under system settings on our start menu, this little button right here, we can do some cool stuff. So we can actually change our themes around and other things. So in the next video, we're gonna get into all kinds of customizations. I just wanna kinda of touch on the basics of just the initial install and setup of Linux Mint and just some basic install of programs. So uh, from here, we can do a lot of things, but uh, We'll go ahead and save all the customization for the next video.